We go. So this week's parsha is Parsha's Bo, page 341. It begins, Hashem said to Moshe, come to Pyro, for I have made his heart and the heart of his servant stubborn, so that I could put these signs of mine in his midst. And so that you may relate in the ears of your son and your son's son that I made a mockery of Egypt and my signs that I placed among them that you may know that I am Hashem. So the Mabin points out that Hashem saying that there are three things he wants, three points he wants to make. First of all, that I made a mockery of Egypt. Give me a second. Let me just fix the... I've got it, but I can't get the thing on the speaker. Okay, so first of all, he's saying that he made a mockery out of Egypt. And that second of all, that the signs that I placed among them. And third, that you may know that I am Hashem. So the Mabin says the meaning of these things are the mockery is that he punished Egypt with these um, miraculous um, punishments. All the plagues were miraculous punishments. And that's the mockery he made of Egypt. Some of the commentaries that's found on this a little further is that Hashem was, every single time Hashem gave Paro an opportunity to, um, to relent and let the Jews go out. And that was, this was after pretty much every plague. He said, let the Jews go out, and if not, I'm going to do the following. And um, Paro did not agree. And in the later plagues, it says that Hashem hardened Paro's heart to give him, to allow him to overcome the, um, overcome the difficulty in setting that, overcome the troubles that he was going through so he'd be able to resist setting them free. And they say that that's the, um, that's the mockery that he made of Egypt and of Paro is that he kept on punishing them and giving them the opportunity to set the Jews free, but at the same time gave him the ability to resist setting them free. So he was playing with him. And then it continues the signs of mine in his midst. And as it says, the signs that I placed among them, those signs are what we talked about it, um, at length last week in Parshas, um, in Parshas Va'era, that um, the purpose of the plagues, the first three plagues were to say that, um, so that you'll know that I am Hashem. The second set of plagues was, so you'll know I am Hashem in the midst of the land. And the third set of plagues was, so you will know that there is none other like me. So those are the signs that Hashem performed for Egypt. And the last statement is that you may know that I am Hashem. So the Malbim said this, this is a callback to the introduction of Parsha's Ve'era, where Hashem said to Moshe that I appeared to Avram, Yitzchak, and Yaakov as Kel Shakai, but my name Hashem, they did not know. And we explained from the Ramban that this means that um, the name Hashem refers to Hashem acting in a miraculous fashion above the laws of nature, Hashem working outside the laws of nature to perform miracles and save us through miracles. And that's what is stated here. So they, you may know that I am Hashem, that we know that Hashem fulfills his promise in a miraculous fashion. And it continues in Pasuk Gimel, verse three. Um, Moshe and Aaron came to Paro and said to him, so said Hashem, God of the Hebrews, and to when will you refuse to be humble before me? Send out my people that they may serve me. For if you refuse to send forth my people, Behold, tomorrow I shall bring a locust swarm into your border. It will cover the surface of the earth so that no, so that one will not be able to see the earth and it will consume the remaining residue that was left to you by the hail and it will consume all the trees that grow for you, for you from the field. It will fill your houses, the houses of all your servants, the house of all Egypt, etc. And, so, um, and he turned and left Paro's presence. And in verse seven, Paro's servant said to him, how long will this be a snare for us? Send out the men that they may serve Hashem their God. Do you not know that Egypt is lost? So Moshe and Aaron will return to Pyro and he said to them, go and serve Hashem and turning to page 343, your God, which ones are going? And I'll talk about that last statement later, but the Ramban points out that it says that Moshe and Aaron left in verse six, end of verse six, it says, and he turned to left Pyro's presence, which it doesn't say about all the other plagues. And the Ramban says this means that he left without permission, without leave of Pyro, that he just turned and went. And this is something that you don't do with a king. You don't, you don't just walk out on your own. You wait till you, he grants you leave, till he gives you permission to leave. And the Ramban says the reason why he did this was because he saw that the people were bothered. And he saw that they, that they wanted to talk about it, to discuss it. And um, they might push Paro to let the Jews go. So he walked out to give them in that opportunity meaning the way a salesman, a good salesman w watches people and recognizes when sometimes he just pushes and pushes and pushes and doesn't take no for an answer, doesn't let you stop. But sometimes if he sees that you're gonna talk about it and might say yes, 
he gives you the opportunity to talk yourself into it. And that's what Moshe was doing. He saw that they wanted to talk. So he gave them the opportunity to talk themselves into, into agreeing to let the Jews go by just walking out. And that's, what, and that's what they did. And as it says in verse seven, Pharaoh's servant said to him, how long will this be a snare for us? Send out the men that they may serve Hashem their God. Do you not know that Egypt is lost? So Pharaoh's advisors were telling him, you have to let them go. So in verse eight, once again, so Moshe and Aaron were returned to Pharaoh and he said to them, go and serve Hashem. So he's agreeing to, what their, to their demands, except he asks your God, which ones are going? And they answered in verse nine, Moses said with our youngsters and with our elders, we shall go with our sons and with our daughters, with our flock, with our cattle, shall we go because it is a festival of Hashem for us. So um, the Rabbin Bachi comments just as an aside that what's this festival of Hashem that is for us? He says this is referring to the festival of Shavuos, which is the giving of the Torah, which was is coming up not a long time after this point since they're in Rosh Chodesh Nisan, so it's coming up. And that's what they were asking for that festival. And it, um, okay, that's just an aside, but um, it, there's a, this is an interesting conversation here. The conversation continues in verse 10. He said to them, so be Hashem with you as I will send you forth with your children. Look, the evil intent is opposite your faith. Not so, let the men go now and serve Hashem for that is what you seek. And he drove them out from Paro's presence. So what's this conversation? Paro asked, which ones are going? You're going to serve God, which ones are going? Moshe said, our youngsters, our elders, our, um, our daughters, our flock with our cattle shall go. And then Paro said, um, look, evil intent is opposite your faces, just let the men go. So what's going on? What's the conversation here? And later we see, um, just skipping a little bit, I'll come back. Am I... So in, later on page 345, verse 24, it says that Paro summoned Moshe and said, go serve Hashem, only your flock and cattle shall remain behind, even your children may go with you. So whereas over here, before the plague of the, of the, um, of the locusts, Paro said that you, should, you um, don't take your children, you don't wanna take your children, but you could take your animals. Now he's saying the opposite. Take your children, but don't take your animals. So as it says, go serve Hashem, only your flock and your cattle shall remain behind, even your children may go with you. So what's this whole conversation between Paro and Moshe? So the Malbim explains that Paro was a pagan. He believed in polytheism. He believed in, mul in multiple gods, many different powers. And um, that belief influenced his thinking to the point that he couldn't grasp the concept of, of, um, of one God, of one power that controls everything. He couldn't even imagine such a concept. So Paro I was asking Moshe, who is gonna go? Is it gonna be the animals or is it gonna be your children? Because like I said, Paro believing in multiple powers. So in his mind, what does it mean if you're bringing an offering? If you're bringing animals and slaughtering them, that's a violent act. You're, you're, you're killing in the service of your deity. So in Paro's mind, that means that you're dealing with a violent deity. You're dealing with an angry, um, vengeful deity and, and that deity needs appeasement through the slaughtering of animals. And if you don't slaughter animals, that deity might, um, might, um, take, might um, attack people and you have to appease them with some violent acts. So Paro was saying that if you're taking animals, meaning you're going to slaughter animals, you're doing these violent acts. So it must be that you're dealing with a violent deity, in which case you don't want to bring kids to that. You don't, you don't want to bring kids to the service of this violent deity because the, this God might start demanding the kids as well for a sacrifice. He might want um, human sacrifice and might want you to offer the kids as well. So he said, you want to keep the kids far away from that kind of service. So he's saying, which one, do, which one is it? Is it an angry God where you need the animals? Or maybe you're going to serve a, um, a happy God, a, a God that's enjoyable to serve, where there's dancing, there's partying, there's happiness. In which case, sure, bring the kids along because it's going to be a great time, but you don't need animals for that. 
because there's no need for offerings. There's no need for appeasement. If there's no need for any violence. And once again, we who are worship one God understand this concept that our, that we are celebrating with Hashem, where that every holiday is a celebration and we're bringing the offerings in celebration and, and to bring us close to Hashem, not as an appeasement for violent impulses, but and to, we're offering up the offerings as a, in a sense, as a stand-in for ourselves, recognizing the sins that we've committed and, and how we want to come close to Hashem. And that's what the offerings represent. But in Paro's mind, offerings only mean appeasement of some anger and, and some violence. So that's what Paro was asking. Paro was asking once again, now after saying that, seeing this again, that so Paro asked, which ones are going? And in verse nine, Moshe said, with our youngsters and with our elders, we shall we go with our sons and with our daughters, with our flock and our cattle shall we go because it is a festival of Hashem for us. So he's saying that we're gonna go with all our animals and with our sons and daughters. And um, Paro said in verse 10, he said to them, so be Hashem with you, I will not say, I will send you forth with your children. Um, so be Hashem with you as I send it, you forth with your children, meaning there's no way in the world I'm going to allow you to take your children to an event where you're bringing animals as offerings. Look, the evil intent is opposite your face, meaning that if the, the, your God is demanding us to, you to slaughter animals, it must be an evil God. That's the evil in front of your face. Not so let the men go now, serve Hashem, for that is what you seek. And Pyro, of course, showing how compassionate he is and how protective he is of the Jewish children that he won't allow them to, he won't allow the Jews to bring their children along to such, an, to such a celebration where they're slaughtering animals. And he drove them out from Paro's presence. Okay, there's other, Shatim, there are other explanations for this um, verse where it says, look, the evil intent is opposite your face. Literally, the evil is in front of you. That Rashi says that, um, that he's telling them that there's a star or the controlling um, there's the controlling zodiac sign, whatever it is, is in front of you. And that, that star, or that zodiac is ra, is bad, is evil. And I think they say that that is Mars, which is the red planet. It's red in the sky. Recently, it was very bright. And you were able to see that red just shining down on you. And that Paro was saying that that's a sign of blood and it's gonna, it's, it's gonna bring violence. If you go out into the desert now, it's going to, it's, 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 you're gonna come to violent end based on that zodiac sign. Um, the Basil Levy though says a fascinating explanation of this. He says, look, the evil is intent is opposite your faces. The Basil Levy says that Paro was telling Moshe that you want to go serve your God. He says, Paro says, I have experience with your God. I've been punished already. Um, seven plagues already, eight plagues, seven plagues. I've been punished already, seven plagues from your God. And I know that um, your God is, the, the punishment is very difficult. And he's saying, I know at some point you're gonna mess up. At some point in the future, you're gonna mess up and you're gonna need, and you're gonna be punished. So I'm telling you that this, this evil is in front of you, that in your future, you're gonna be punished just like I'm punished. Of course, Paro not understanding the concept of chufa, of repentance, and the offerings which bring us close to Hashem and allow us to return to Hashem. So it continues in verse 12, Hashem said to Moshe, stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locust swarm, um, for the locust swarm, and it will ascend upon the land of Egypt and eat all the grass of the land, everything that the hell has left, and that's what he did. And in verse 14, the locust swarm ascended over the entire land of Egypt, it rested in the entire border of Egypt very severely. Before, the, before there was never a locust swarm like it, and after it, there will not be its equal. This is the worst that's ever occurred in Egypt. In verse 15, it, it covered the surface of the entire land, and the land was darkened. It, it ate all the grass of the land, all the fruit of the trees that the hell it left. No greenery remained on the trees or the grass of the field in the entire land of Egypt. So these locusts ate everything. Can we go back to verse 13? Sure. In all the plagues that have, we've had so far, Moshe and Aaron initiated the plague by doing something with their staff. In right. 13, the locusts won't come until there's an east wind, an intermediate step. What's the significance of that? I don't know. I, I and that is the usual way of locusts coming, meaning locusts ride the wind. That's how they travel. They fly, but they're blown. They pretty much go wherever the wind blows. 
And I think that that's also what happened in some of the other plagues. Let me see. Um, meaning in other plagues, for example, he stretched out his uh, staff over the river and the frogs hopped out. It's there, his staff did, meaning he stretched out his staff and something happened. With the, um, also in the plague of boils, um, he, threw a, um, he threw handfuls of soot, I'm on page 335, and um, it just spread out, the soot spread out over all of Egypt. So um, there were kind of intermediate steps before. The significance of the east wind. Um, I would like to say bad things usually come from the east, but that's not the case. And according to Kabbalah, Kabbalistic thought, bad things come from the north. So um, I don't know. Let me see if Rashi says. I don't know. Um, I don't know, I'm sorry. I missed okay. the part of it. What's that? I missed the part where I spread all the ashes over the land. Yeah, I kind of skipped over that, that last week, but that was by the plague of the boils, that it says that, um, that Aaron and Moshe each had a handful of soot and they put it in Moshe's hand and Moshe threw it up and it's that soot spread out all over the land of Egypt and wherever it landed, they had boils. And that's on page 330, that's on page 335, verse um, 8 and 9, if you would like to see it. I recall that the uh, evil in front of your faces also can refer to the ego. What's that? The evil in front of your faces refers to the ego. The, the ego, something like that. I don't think I've seen that. What I have seen is that I mentioned Rashi. The Rashi says that it's the, the star of the, um, the, of the, the red star, Mars was up in the sky and he said that's a sign of blood and like and blood and bloodshed and what it was was actually the blood of the bris mila and the blood of the korban pesach that um, both occur in this week's parsha that every that in order to bring a korban pesach they had to have a bris mila so they all circumcised themselves and everybody got circumcised and they slaughtered the korban pesach and spread the blood on their doorposts and that's what it signified but I don't think I've seen that it was signifying the eagle, the golden calf. Okay, so moving on. In verse, uh, one second. Yeah, moving on in verse 16, it says, Paro hastened to summon Moshe and Aaron and said, I have sinned to Hashem, your God, unto you. And now please forgive my sin just this time and, and entreat Hashem, your God, that he removed me only this death. And he did. And in verse 19, Hashem turned back a very powerful west wind and it carried the locust swarm and hurled it towards the Sea of Reeds. Not a single locust remained within the entire border of Egypt, but Hashem strengthened the heart of Paro and he did not send out the children of Israel. Okay. And in verse 21, page 345, verse 21 was the plague of darkness. Hashem said to Moshe, stretch forth your hand towards the heavens, there shall be a darkness upon the land of Egypt and the darkness will be tangible. Moshe stretched forth his hand towards the heavens and there was a thick darkness throughout the land of Egypt for a three day period. No man could see his brother nor could anyone rise from his place for a three day period, but for all the children of Israel, there was a light in their dwelling. So the, um, the Ramban explains this whole idea of this darkness that it's a tangible darkness. That means that it wasn't just the absence of light. It wasn't just that they couldn't see the sun shining and it didn't light them up. If that was the case, they could light a candle, they could light a torch and um, even um, not that they couldn't see any light, but it was that it, the Ramban says that it was like a thick mist or fog that was so thick that it was tangible and light couldn't penetrate it. So um, it was just total darkness. Even if they lit a candle, the Ramban says the candle would, wouldn't be able to stay lit from this thick fog. And um, so there was absolutely no light for the Egyptians in all the land of Egypt. The Medr says that the darkness was, was so thick that it held them in place that they couldn't get up the Ramban seems to understand that just they couldn't go anywhere because they couldn't see. It was, uh, if you could imagine being in total darkness everywhere where there's nothing that you could do to take any of the darkness away, 
that you can't light a flashlight, you can't light a candle, there's no starlight, there's no sunlight, there's no moonlight, you can't really do anything. And that's what that's what how the Ramban understands this is that it was complete total darkness where there was nothing they could do anything about because there was a thick fog that complete that was impenetrable that light couldn't penetrate. Okay, and then in verse twenty four, Paro summoned Moshe and said, "Go serve Hashem. Only your flocks and cattle shall remain behind. Even your children may go with you." As we and as we said, Paro was saying that I must have been mistaken when I offered. To allow the men to um, the men to men and animals to go, but not the children, because I thought this was an angry God that needed appeasement through violence. It must be that this is a happy God that that's lots of fun. So in which case, take your children, but leave your animals behind. And Moshe replied in verse twenty-five. Moshe said, even if you will place in our hands feast offerings and elevation offerings, and we shall offer them to Hashem our God, and our livestock as well, go with us. Not a hoof will left be left, for it shall be with. Um, for it shall, um, for, for from it we shall serve Hashem our God, and we will not know with what we are to serve Hashem until our arrival there. So it's telling Paro that we're going to take everything. And of course, Paro understood that if they took everything, he had no, they'd have no reason to come back. So now in verse 27, Hashem strengthened the heart of Paro. He did not wish to send them out. Paro said to him, Go from me, beware, do not see my face anymore. From the day you see my face, you shall die. And Moshe said, you have spoken correctly. I shall never see your face again. I'm not going to come back. So now in verse 11, it says, Hashem sent to Moshe. Why, why did Moshe agree to that? Um, he says, on the day that you see me, I'll, that you'll die and uh, I won't see you again. And even though in the future, he really did see him. Mm -hmm. uh, did he? Mm -hmm. Yes. Didn't he? <laughs> um, I mean, it seems that well, he, he he went to Moshe to tell him to let them go. But at least he didn't see him. He didn't come back in the palace. And I think that's that's what it's referring to. But didn't Paro come well, he, to him? He, he came to him. He came. Right. I don't know if he actually saw him, though. He was, you know, the, the song Paro in pajamas in the middle of the night. In the dark. And he was just like running out in the middle of the night looking for mm -hmm. Moshe. And what you're referring to, I'm trying to find it. You just got a piece of paper. Um, in verse, this is on page 357. Where is it? Oh, my That's Kalua. Uh, yes. David Eichelbaum says hello. Oh, hi, David. Hello there. <laughs> Yes, so it, I'm, I'm not seeing the commentaries mention that, but you're right. It does say on page um, 357 that Paro rose up, this is page 357, verse 30, Paro rose up at midnight, he and all his servants in all of Egypt. And verse 31, he called to Moshe out at night and said, rise up, go out from amongst my people, even you, even the children of Israel, go and serve Hashem as you have spoken. It could be that he didn't see them and they didn't see him, that he was going at night. But anyway, there is actually a, a story that they say about one of the great sages in Europe that as a child, that there was a question that came up about someone who swore an oath that um, they, would never, um, they would never see this person again, a person again. And that person died and they wanted to go to the funeral and they were asking, are they allowed to do that? Could they do that? And um, this great, Rabbi, as a, as a young boy, said that you could bring a proof from, from this um, statement of Moshe that, um, that Moshe said, um, that Paro said, you'll never see me again. Moshe agreed. Yet later it says that um, Paro and all his officers were washed up from the sea after the splitting of the sea. So he brought a proof that once someone's dead, they are, you are able to, that's not counted as seeing them. But you're right, it must be that since they came at night, they couldn't actually see Paro. Okay, anyway, moving on. Go back to us. I'm, I'm back to page 315, 349, it's on verse 12. It states, Hashem said to Moshe and Aaron in the land of Egypt saying, this month shall be for you the beginning of the months. It shall be for you the first of the months of the year. There's actually two ways to interpret this verse that um, the commentators interpreted. Rashi actually goes 
um, on a less um, surface level, Rashi says, says that he was actually not referring really to the month, but he was referring to the moon. And he was telling you this moon is the beginning of the month. And this is the mitzvah of Kiddush HaChodesh, of sanctifying the new month. And he was telling him that the way that we begin months is not through a calendar, and definitely not a solar calendar. Rather, the way we traditionally have um, set our calendar is through testimony about someone seeing a new moon. And that is that, you know, the moon appears, as it appears and then it gets bigger and bigger until you have a full moon where it's a full disk. And then it gradually gets smaller until it vanishes. And then it comes back again as the, moon, as the new moon. And Hashem showed him the new moon. And as it says here, that um, the, it says, well, this is the first of the month. So he showed him that new moon and says, this is what the moon looks like at the beginning of the month. And that's how we decide when our month starts is by someone coming to the high court in Jerusalem and testifying that they saw that moon. Nowadays, since we don't have that court, so I mean, nowadays for the last few thousand years, some of the great sages of the Mishnah and Gemara set up a um, calendar system where um, that we follow with a, that has a cycle, a 19 year cycle of, um, of leap months in order to have the um, have the lunar year coincide or correspond to the solar year, so the um, the holidays don't get out of whack. So Pesach will always be in the spring, but um, but it used to be when the temple was around and we had a high court in Jerusalem that that actually people would go into Jerusalem and testify that they saw a new moon, and that's how we decided when the month started. And that's what this verse is referring to. And um, the Ramban has a different understanding of this, which is a more, the more obvious explanation, is that this month shall be the beginning of the months of the year, meaning that when we count the months, we start counting from Nisan, from um, the month that we left Egypt. And the Ramban says that we see this throughout the Torah, that when the Torah gives a date, the Torah doesn't have names of the months. We don't have, nowadays we call it Nisan year, Sivan, which we'll talk about in a second, but the Ramban says that in the Torah, it calls it the first month, the second month. It was in the third month and second of, of sixth of the month. That is Shavuos. That's when the Torah was given. So maybe. Um, but, um, and, and it counts the months from Nisan, which is, if you think about it, it's very strange because that's not when the year starts. Our years start from Rosh Hashanah, which is the beginning of the month of Tishrei. So when we're working with the Jewish calendar, things get ve are very out of whack because the year actually changes over from one, one year to the next on this, in the beginning of the seventh month, counting from Pesach, counting from Nisan, the month that Pesach falls out in, but throughout the Torah, it refers to the months starting with um, Nisan, starting with the month that Pesach falls out with, um, Rosh Hashanah when we change over as month seven through 12 for Adar, and then we start over from Nisan. But the Ramban says that nowadays we actually do use names for the months. Like I said, we call it Nisan, Ir, Sivan, and those are Babylonian names. Those are names that we adopted in our exile in Babylon. And the, and the Ramban says the reason for that is, is that it's a, based on a passage from Yermia, a passage in Jeremiah, that says that the miracles when we return to Jerusalem, that the reason why we count from, the, from this month, we count from the month of Nisan, is to commemorate the um, great miracles of Hashem taking us out of Egypt. So whenever we count a month, we say it's the first month, it's the second month, it's, it's, it's the third month. What we're saying is, it's, let's say we say it's the third month, we're saying that it's three months from the month that Hashem took us out of Egypt. So every time we mention a month, we're thinking about our redemption from Egypt. And just as an aside, the, when we in the Torah, when we talk about days of the week, it's the same thing. That instead of the instead of having names for the days of the week, Shabbos has a name, but every other day is day one, day two, day three, day four, which are the days and the days after Shabbos. That it's day one until and day two, then day three, and it's all in reference to Shabbos. And whatever, whenever we mention a day of the week, it ma it makes us think about Shabbos. So. Um, and so the Ramban says, but the, the, the verse from Yermia says that the miracles when we return from our exile in Babylon will be so great that, that they might like override the miracles when we left Egypt. And because of that, we use Babylonian, the, 
Babylonian names for the months to commemorate that Hashem redeemed us from that exile in Babylon. Okay, so moving on. And on page 351, we have the mitzvah of the Paschal Lamb. And page 351 at the top says, speak to the entire assembly of Israel, saying on the 10th of this month, they shall take for themselves each man a lamb or a kid, a kid being a young goat, just to be clear. Uh, for each father's house, a lamb or a kid for the household, but if the household is too small, etc., then um, they can join together with their neighbors. Um, and in verse 6, it shall be yours for examination until the 14th of this month. The entire congregation of the Assembly of Israel shall slaughter it in the afternoon of the 14th of the month of Nisan. They shall take some of its blood and place it on the two doorposts and the lintel of the houses in which they will eat it. They shall eat the flesh on that night, roasted over fire and matzahs with bitter herbs. With matzahs and bitter herbs, they shall eat it. In verse 9, you shall not eat it partially roasted or cooked in water, only roasted over fire. That's the only way that the paschal lamb is kosher, if it's roasted over fire. Um, its legs and with its innards, you shall not leave any of it until morning. Any of it that is left until morning, you shall burn in the fire. So we have to eat that in the entire um, lamb. And in verse 11, it states, so shall you eat it, your loins girded, your shoes on your feet, your feet, your staff in your hands, you shall eat it in haste. It is a Pesach offering to Hashem that the mitzvah was that night they were to eat it all ready to go because they were going to be taken out of Egypt that, that the following morning. So they're commanded to eat it packed and ready to go. And it continues in verse 12. I shall go through Egypt on this night and I shall strike every firstborn in the land of Egypt from man to beast and against all the gods of Egypt, I shall meet up judgment. I am Hashem. The blood shall be assigned for you upon the houses where you are. When I see the blood, I shall pass over you and there shall not be a plague of destruction upon you when I strike in this land of Egypt. This day shall be a remembrance for you and you shall celebrate it as a festival for Hashem for your generations as an eternal decree shall you celebrate it. Until now, the mitzvah was specifically for that year specifically for the first Pesach that we celebrated in Egypt. And now we're continuing that this is going to be a mitzvah every year. For the for a seven day period on page 355, you shall eat matzahs, but on the previous day, you shall nullify the leaven from your homes. For anyone who eats leaven's food, that so shall be cut off from Israel from the first day to the seventh day, that there's a mitzvah not to eat chametz, not to eat bread or any leavened food. On the first day shall be holy, etc. And in verse 17, you shall safeguard the matzahs, for on the ver this very day I will have taken your legion out of the land of Egypt. You shall observe this day for your generations as an eternal decree, etc. Okay, so that's the mitzvah of the Paschal Lamb and the mitzvah of matzahs. Now in verse 21, it says, Moshe called to the elders of Israel and said to them, draw forth and buy for yourselves one of the flock of your family. So now Moshe is telling over this mitzvah to them with a little more elaboration that wasn't mentioned before. It says in verse 22, you shall take a bundle of hyssop, that's a bush, and dip it into the blood that is in the basin and touch the lentil on the two doorposts with some of the blood that is in the basin. And as for you, you shall not leave the entrance of the house until morning. And then Hashem will pass through to smite Egypt and he will see the blood that is on the lentil on the two doorposts and Hashem will pass over the entrance. He will not permit the destroyer to enter your homes to smite. You shall observe this decree as a decree for yourself and your children forever. So here it says that he will not just permit the destroyer to enter your home to smite. And many of the commentaries ask that here it implies that there's some angelic force that was sent to kill the Egyptian firstborns. And Hashem's not going to allow this, that angelic force, this destroyer, this destructive angel to come into the Jewish homes. And they ask that in the Haggadah, we say very clearly that, um, and this is a, based on a Brisa saying of our sages from the Mishnah, that um, it's Hashem specifically that Hashem is killing all the Egyptians without any angelic help. That says that I'm going to go through Egypt, I am not an angel, and I will strike the firstborns of Egypt, I am not an angel. And with the gods of Egypt, I will make wonders, I am not an angel, that everything will be done by Hashem, not through an angel. So how is, so why is it that, um, that here it says, I will not permit the destroying angel to ent enter your home. So Rav Akiva Eger answers that um, with a question, like a good joke, he answers this question with another question. And that is based on the end of the Parsha. It says um, in verse, on page 361, chapter 13, verse one. 
that the Torah says, Hashem spoke to Moshe saying, sanctify to me every firstborn, the first issue of every womb among the children of Israel of man and beast is mine. That every um, Bukhar, we call it, every firstborn, the first issue of every womb, meaning the firstborn from the mother specifically, is sanctified to Hashem. And it says again in, um, on page 363, verse 11, it says, it shall come to pass when Hashem will bring you to the land of Canaan as he swore to you and your forefathers and he will have given you. Then you shall set apart every first issue of the womb to Hashem and every first issue that is dropped by livestock that belongs to you, the males are Hashem's. Every first issue, donkey, you shall redeem with a lamb, etc. And um, in verse 14, it shall be when your sons will ask you at some future time, what is this? You shall say to him, with a strong hand, Hashem removed us from Egypt from the house of bondage. And it happened when Paro stubbornly refused to send us out that Hashem killed all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of man to the firstborn of beast. Therefore, I offer to Hashem all male first issue of the womb, and I shall redeem all the firstborns of my sons. So Rabbi Kiva Eger asks that the mitzvah of the firstborns was only the firstborn male, uh, only the firstborn of the mother. Once again, there it also says that the first issue, um, the first issue of the womb. Yet, when Hashem killed, and it said the reason why is because Hashem killed the firstborns of Egypt and spared um, our firstborns. So why is it when, when Hashem killed the firstborns of Egypt, it doesn't say that it was only the firstborn from the mother's side, it was every firstborn. So why is it that we only sanctify the firstborn from the mother and not the firstborn from the father? So Rebekah Eger says that one question answers the other question. And that is that the Egyptians were a very um, immoral nation very, um, and they were not, um, they were very involved in adultery. And therefore, the, 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 the firstborns were so tangled, the families were so tangled up, nobody knew who was the firstborn from the father. A firstborn from the mother was very easy to tell. This is the first baby that she gave birth to, but the firstborn from the father, who knows? They're full of adultery. Who knows who the father of any child was? And therefore, the firstborn from the mother's side, that's where the mashkas, that's where this destructive angel came in. And the destructive angel killed those, and that's what we needed saving for. And that's why we're thankful to Hashem that Hashem saved our firstborns from the, um, our firstborns that the mashkas, this destructive angel, wasn't given permission to, to, um, to kill them. But when it came to the firstborn from the father, there only God knows who that was. And therefore, the, um, therefore, that Om Hashem specifically, that decree Hashem specifically carried out. And that we, since it's Hashem doing it, we don't need any saving. Hashem kills the ones who are, should be killed and leaves the one who shouldn't be killed alone so that we don't need a special protection for, so that we don't need, um, that we don't need to sanctify the firstborn from the father's side. Okay, that's uh, interesting, Rabbi Kivega. Okay, so moving on. And on page 357, verse 29, or just backing up a little bit, 28, the children of Israel went and did as Hashem commanded Moshe and Aaron, so they did. That they did exactly what Hashem commanded Moshe and Aaron. And the Ramban explains this mitzvah of the Paschal lamb that were commanded to offer up a lamb or a goat is that the Egyptians worshipped the lamb there or the goat. And some commentaries mentioned that the, um, the um, zodiac sign for the month of Nisan is Aries, which is the ram, which is the lamb. So um, that was the something that the Egyptians held very highly of, and they would have worshipped it that month. So for the Jews to take the um, lamb and or take a sheep or a goat at that time was a strong repudiation of the idolatry of the Egyptians. And because the, the Jews had assimilated to an extent, in Egyptian society, and there were many Jews who did worship idols, so we had this mitzvah to take the Egyptian deity and slaughter it and offer it to Hashem as a um, repudiation of the Egyptian culture and the Egyptian idolatry before we were taken out of Egypt. Okay, and in verse 29 on page 357, it was at midnight that Hashem smote every firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh sitting on his throne to the firstborn of the captive, 
And like we said in verse 30, Paro rose up in midnight, he and all his servants in all of Egypt. And there was a great outcry in Egypt for there was not a house where there was no corpse. He called Moshe and Aaron at night and said, rise up, go out from among my people, even you, even the children of Israel, go and serve Hashem as you have spoken. Take even your sheep, even your cattle as you have spoken, go and bless me as well. So he has pray for me too. And in verse 34, the people on page 359, the people picked up its dough before it could become leavened and their, their leftover was bound up in their garments upon their shoulders. The children of Israel carried out the word of Moshe. They requested from the Egyptians silver vessels, gold vessels, and garments. Hashem gave the people favor in the eyes of the Egyptians and they granted their request so they emptied Egypt. That the people, Hashem made it miraculously, the people did not resent the Jews for all the plagues and all the difficulties that they went through. And instead, they recognized that they were being punished and they deserved it. And they held the Jews in high esteem. So that's what they did. They traveled from there and in verse 39, um, they baked the dough that they took out of Egypt into unleavened cakes for they could not be leavened for they were driven out of Egypt for they could not delay nor had they made provisions for themselves. So Rashi says on that, that um, they were driven out so quickly that they weren't even able to bake the bread and that's why it was matzah. They weren't even, even able to let the bread rise and that's why it was matzah. And the Ramban asks on that, what is Rashi talking about? We had just seen that they were commanded in the mitzvah of not eating chametz on Pesach. That was just earlier in the Parsha, that, excuse me, that they were not allowed to eat chametz. So of course they didn't allow the bread to rise. If they would have let the bread rise, it would be chametz and they wouldn't be allowed to eat it. So the Ramban understands that, they, that the reason why they didn't let the bread rise was because it was prohibited, because it was Pesach. And what it's saying here is that um, they baked the dough they took out of Egypt into unleavened cakes, for they could not be leavened, for they were driven out of Egypt. Meaning, why did they bake it then? They baked it, first it says they went from Ramses to Sukkot, and then to Sukkos, which was the name of the place, and then they baked the bread, meaning that they couldn't break, bake it earlier because they were driven out of Egypt so quickly. So they had to just keep the dough in a way that it wouldn't rise. Okay, then it says the habitation of the children of Israel during which they dwelled in Egypt was 430 years. And the commentaries say that it was actually 210 years that they were in Egypt, but it was 430 years from the time that Avram was told that their children would be, in, in, would be subjugated in the land that wasn't theirs and they would be oppressed there. It was 430 years from that point until they left Egypt. And it continues, it was at the end of 430 years, it was on the, that very day that all the legions of Hashem left the land of Egypt. What does it mean it was on that very day? The Medrash says that that means that it was it was in the middle, it was in the, in the middle, the light of the day. Meaning that, it, that they could have left the night before, they could have left early morning. But Hashem wanted them to leave smack in the middle of the day with, um, with all the lights shining on them. So the Egyptians couldn't claim that they left like a thief in the night where nobody was looking. They left with their heads held high in front of all the Egyptians with the light shining on them saying, if you want to stop us, try to stop us. And um, okay, then it discusses a little more about the Pesach offering. And as we said, the uh, Parsha concludes with two interesting Parshas. This is on page 361, chapter 13. As we said, there's the mitzvah to sanctify the firstborn of every womb among the children of Israel, every Jewish firstborn, and the firstborn of animals. And then on page 363, it states, um, and the mitzvah of matzah again, and in verse nine, it states, and it shall be for you a sign on your arm and a reminder between your eyes so that Hashem's story shall be in your mouth for it's a strong hand Hashem removed you from Egypt, you shall observe this to be as it's at its designated time from year to year. Saying that we have inside our tefillin on our arms and our heads, we have mention of our leaving Egypt. And again, it says on the bottom of page 362, verse 11, it discusses more about when we come to the land of Canaan, then we have the mitzvah of sanctifying our firstborns and the firstborns of our livestock. And... Um, Again, it says the Parsha concludes in verse 16 on page 365, concludes, and it shall be a sign upon your arm and an ornament between your eyes with a strong hand, Hashem removes us from Egypt. Again, mentioning that we, um, we talk about that the verses that are inside on the scrolls, inside our tefillin, discuss our leaving um, Egypt. And in fact, these two paragraphs are two of the paragraphs that are written inside our tefillin, that in the 
head to fill in, you'll see that there are four compartments. There are four scrolls inside the head to fill in, and each one has a separate section of the Torah written on them. Two of them are these last two sections of Parsha's bow that talk about our leaving Egypt and putting on tefillin. And it also has the first two paragraphs of Shema, which are um, also mentioned, the putting on tefillin. And um, all four are written on one scroll in the tefillin that goes on our arm. I just wanted to mention quickly about the Haftorah on page 1151, the Haftorah for Parsha's bow. It's from Yermia. And just as this week's Parsha discusses how Egypt was destroyed to the point that they allowed the Jews and their slaves to leave Egypt, so it discusses a later destruction of Egypt, and that is the destruction of Egypt by the Babylonians. And as it says um, on page 1151, the word of Hashem that spoke to Jeremiah, Yermia the prophet, that Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, would come to strike the land, land of Egypt, um, proclaim in Egypt, make her in Migdal, make her in Nof and um, Tifane, say, stand erect and prepare yourself for the sword, which will have devoured all your surroundings. Why have each of your mighty ones been washed away? He has not stood because Hashem had buffeted him. He has caused much, much stumbling. Indeed, one fell against the other, and he said, let us arise and return to our people in the land of our birth. And they called out to power. The blustery king of Egypt has let the time go by. And Hashem sent him, um, Yermia, Yermia, as a messenger to Egypt that the Egyptians are going to be destroyed by the Babylonians. But it concludes in verse 17, but you, but I'm um, sorry, verse 27, but you be not afraid, my servant Yaakov, be not frightened, O Israel, for I will save you from afar and your offspring from the land of their captivity. And Yaakov shall return and be tranquil and complacent, and none shall make him tremble. You be not afraid, my servant Jacob, the words of Hashem, for I am with you. So I'll make an end to all the nations where I've scattered you, but of you, I shall not make an end. I shall punish you with justice, but I shall not destroy you utterly. That now the, the nation of Egypt is completely doesn't exist. Now Egypt is a nation of Arabs who came from, from the Arabian Peninsula. They're not native to Egypt. And there's no Egyptian nation any that in existence anymore. And there's no Babylonian nation anymore. Now it's Iraq once again an Arab controlled nation, the native Babylonians that um, nationality doesn't exist, but the Jews were scattered around the nations, but Hashem's with us and will never be destroyed. Okay, everybody have a great, let's see if I could stop this, everybody have a